Okay, welcome everyone. We are proceeding with our lecture series on inferential statistics with R. And in today's lesson, we are going to look at correlation analysis using the R programming language. So my name is Elijah Pia from Ghana. I am an economist by profession and I love everything about R. And so that is the very reason why you always see me smiling. If you want to reach me, that is my email on the screen. So as part of the Statistical Inference Lecture Series, we have these 12 series, and we've already covered the very first one, which had to do with the concepts and applications. And then we are, for today, going to look at correlation analysis. And so the goals for this lesson is to be able to express statistical relationships between variables, and also carry out and interpret correlations in R. And you will also get to understand how correlation becomes a precursor to regression analysis. And so how do we measure relationships? To measure how two variables are associated, we need to look at how they co-vary. And so that brings into the scene what we call covariance. And for that matter, if you want to calculate the population covariance, it is just the the cross product of the deviations of the two variables that you want to measure their covariance divided by the population. And the sample covariance would rather have the denominator as n minus one. You know, we're not going to go into the details of how these formulas were coined because in one way or the other, we are familiar with this sort of uh, formula for calculating the covariance for population and that of sample. So when it comes to this population covariance and sample covariance, you would notice that the X and Y are simply the two variables for which we want to measure how associated they are. The X bar represents the mean of the first variable X. The Y bar represents the mean of the second variable. And the N, whether uppercase or the lowercase, is simply the number of observations. Uppercase for that of the population, and then the lowercase for that of the sample. So let's say we have two variables, temperature and ice cream sales. So in this case, temperature is given as X and then ice cream sales given as Y. We want to look at how these two variables are associated. So we will tend to calculate the covariance. Now, in that case, we would need to find the deviation, all right, for the two variables. So we would have X minus the mean and then y minus its mean. And so for that matter, we go ahead and calculate the mean of x, and that gives us 73.5. And we calculate the mean of y, and that also gives us 13. Now, in which case, we tend to create additional columns where we find the deviations from the actual scores. So we have the deviation of x and the deviation of y, and then we just find their cross product. Now, enough of this tabular representation because most of the things that we actually do when it comes to some of these lectures, we build intuition, we just go right into R and then implement it. So covariance actually tells us the direction of the relationship. So if you calculate the covariance between two variables and it is positive, then there is a positive relationship between the variables. If it is negative, then there is a negative relationship. But if it is zero, then there is no relationship at all. So there is also this concept called correlation. Now, correlation tells both the direction and the strength of the relationship. So the basic difference between covariance and that of correlation is such that covariance would only tell you the direction, whether positive or negative or no relationship, but the correlation will also give you an idea of how strong the relationship between the two variables would be. And so that is simply um, the correlation coefficient is calculated as the covariance between X and Y divided by their standard errors. Now, um, let's grab this kind of concept. You know, whenever we want to standardize scores, there is a concept that we refer to as Z-scores, which simply looks at, for instance, the deviation. So let's say you have a score minus its mean divided by the standard deviation that gives you the Z-score. So correlation is just a standardization of covariance. So as long as you divide the covariance by their standard deviations, that is the standard deviation of X and the standard deviation of Y, then all you are trying to do 
is to standardize the covariance. And so that gives you the correlation coefficient. Now, the idea is that when you are measuring covariance, so say, for instance, you are looking at the relationship that exists between distance and maybe another variable. Now, the distance in kilometers, if you do that with the other variable and then you get a positive covariance, by changing the distance from kilometers to miles, the kind of value you get for the covariance will not necessarily be the same as that which you get for the kilometers. So at a point in time, there is a difference between how the distance was measured, one in kilometers, the other in miles. So at the end of the day, we need to standardize um, the, the scores so that no matter what form of measurement a variable um, is actually measured, we can standardize the score to a certain unit where it becomes easy for us to tell both the direction and that of the strength. And that is where the correlation coefficient comes in. So if you look at this formula, the COV and the parenthesis X and Y simply represents the covariance of X and Y. The S subscript X represents the standard deviation of X and the S subscript Y represents the standard deviation of Y. So we are only standardizing and that yields what we refer to as the correlation coefficient. So like we have explained before, correlation would tell both the direction and strength of the relationship. And actually, after the standardization of covariance and we get a correlation coefficient, the correlation coefficient lies between negative one and one with these two values inclusive. So it lies, let me make it from negative one to positive one. And so let us look at this sort of uh, dimensional um, line that gives you an idea about um, how, how the direction and the strength of relationship would be when it comes to correlation coefficient. So we have this number line where it starts from negative one to one. Now, if your correlation coefficient is negative one, that means it has the two variables would have the perfect negative correlation. If the correlation coefficient is one, then the two variables would have a perfect positive correlation. But if the correlation coefficient is zero, then it means that the two variables have no relationship whatsoever. Now, grabbing your values from zero, correlation coefficient of zero to one, you'd see that there is a middle 0 0.5. That 0 0.5 would be a moderate positive relationship. But from zero to the 0 0.5, between zero and the 0 0.5, there is going to be a positive relationship, but it is just weak. So we just classify that those values as weak positive correlation. And if you're also moving from 0 0.5 to positive one, you are approaching a perfect positive correlation situation. And so for that matter, we describe those range of values between 0 0.5 and one as strong positive correlation. If we take this to the left as well, you will notice that the negative 0 0.5, which lies in the middle of zero and negative one, simply would be a negative relationship, but moderate in terms of strength. Then moving from between zero and negative 0 0.5, there is a negative relationship, but weak. And then from negative 0 0.5 to negative one, there is a negative relationship, but very strong because we are approaching a perfect negative correlation. So this is how we interpret correlation coefficient. It lies between negative one and one with these two values inclusive. So covariance technically can be implemented in R using the COV function. And you simply pass into it the two variables that you want to measure how they co-vary or how they are associated. And so if you also want to compute the correlation, then you have to use the COR function and also pass in the two variables for which you want to measure the correlation. So at this point, we go right into R and implement that. So in R, if you recall from the earlier slides, you notice that we had two variables, temperature and that of ice cream sales. And we want to look at the relationship that exists between these two variables. So is it that if temperature is increasing, are there going to be more ice cream sales or are there going to be less ice cream sales? We want to look at how uh, these two variables co-vary, right? So the first instance is that we need to run these two lines of code. So I am going to go ahead and run them, right? And then we can use the COV function and simply pass into it x equals the uppercase x and then y equals the uppercase y. 
Now we are using the lowercase s because that is the name of the argument that are passed into the uh, covariance function. And so at a point when your argument follow in a systematic order in the covariance function, you don't need to specify the names of the arguments. So I can just get rid of the argument names and simply use covariance x comma y. And so when that happens and I run this line of code, we get a positive value that is 36.42857, which shows that there is a positive relationship between temperature and ice cream sales. And so once there is a positive relationship, it means that they move in the same direction. And for that matter, if temperature increases, then there is going to be more ice cream sales. And if temperature drops, there is going to be less ice cream sales. So they all move in the same direction. If it had been negative, then they move in opposite direction, all right? But this is positive. So we said there is a positive relationship between temperature and ice cream sales. So just like we said, the covariance would only inform us about the direction of the relationship. So we ended up establishing that simply there is just a positive relationship. But it doesn't give us any idea about the strength of the relationship. And so we'll just go ahead and use the COR function. And then we pass into the function, the two arguments X and that of Y. And so by running that line of code as well, now we notice that we have 0 0.988 in three decimal places. So if you want to convert this one to percentage, all you have to do is multiply this value by 100. And then you would notice that we have 98.8% uh, relationship between temperature and ice cream sales. Now this 98% gives you an idea about how strong the relationship is going to be. One, the correlation coefficient was found to be positive. So yes, the direction is such that there is a positive relationship between temperature and ice cream sales. But now it also tells us on a range of zero to 100%, of course, we get to realize that there is a 98.8% positive relationship between temperature and ice cream sales. So that is to say that these two variables are strongly correlated or they have a strong relationship, all right? Almost a perfect relationship. So this is how we compute the covariance and that of the correlation. So the correlation gives you the direction as well as strength of the relationship. So when it is positive, positive relationship, and then if it is between 0 0.5 and 1, it is a very strong relationship. So that is to say that these two variables are strongly uh, related. However, remember that in our earlier lectures, we got to establish that correlation does not imply causation. So the fact that we've been able to establish a relationship between temperature and ice cream sales would not mean that ice cream sales cause temperature or temperature cause ice cream sales. So that is not to say that temperature has some kind of direct influence on the sales of ice cream. There might be instances where temperature might increase, yet the number of sales would go down, although there is a positive relationship. So the correlation only tells us the relationship and nothing more um, 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 causality doesn't come into the scene all right so let's go back to the slides and then we proceed from there so the correlation coefficient which measured the relationship between temperature and ice cream sales is actually known as the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient or we just simply call it person correlation coefficient, which was actually coined by the statistician known as Carl Pearson, right? So R by default calculates the person correlation coefficient, all right? Now, when after calculating the correlation coefficient, we would like to determine whether this relationship that existed between temperature and that of ice cream sales was significant or not. So we end up formulating a hypothesis. Anytime we are going to make decisions on statistical significance, there is a hypothesis. So the null hypothesis will state that the correlation coefficient R equals zero. That means correlation is not different from zero. It is zero. That is the sense of the word, right? Sometimes we just express some of these terms in negatives. So 
um, correlation is just zero. That is to say that there is no relationship between temperature and that of ice cream sales. But then the alternative hypothesis states that it is not equal to zero. That should tell you that, of course, there is some relationship between temperature and that of uh, ice cream sales. So whether it is positive or negative relationship, there is some uh, relationship between these two variables. All right. So this is how we kind of test a hypothesis of whether truly two variables are correlated or not. Also, we can compute what we call the confidence interval for the correlation coefficient. And the confidence interval earlier on, we've got to understand that it happens to be the range of values uh, such that there is a specified probability that our estimate is actually falling in, in that particular range, right? So that describes the confidence with which you are working with the test. And so in order to calculate the significance and also determine the confidence interval for the correlation coefficient, in R, we use the core dot test function. So cor dot test, and then we pass into it the two variables. And so one more thing that we need to look at after we are considering determining significance of our correlation coefficient, you can also explain the relationship that exists between the variables in, in terms of variation. So there is another term that is coined, which is referred to as the R squared. Now we normally see this sort of measurement in regression analysis. That is why we get to understand that correlation analysis is a precursor to regression analysis. So R squared is also known as the coefficient of determination. Now, it is the explained variation to the total variation. It's just simply the square of the correlation coefficient. That is just R squared. Okay, so for instance, if you want to interpret this R squared, all you are trying to say is that a variation in one of the variables for which you are measuring the relationship, a variation in one of the variable explains the R square value times 100% variation in the other variable. So remember the correlation that we had between temperature and ice cream sales. It was 0 0.988. So that is just to say there is about 98% relationship uh, between temperature and ice cream sales. So we need to take the square value of that 0 0.988 and whatever result we get, we multiply by 100% and say that that value um, percentage explains one word of the variables explains that values percentage in, in the other one. Okay, it will become much more clear as we proceed, okay? So let us go right into R and practice it as well. So once this is established, the first thing that I want us to look at is after calculating the correlation between temperature and that of sales, we have the value of 0 0.988 now, what I really want to do is let me calculate the R squared for that. So I will just simply square the correlation value. All right, so I just say to the power of two. So once I do that and run this line of code, then I get 0 0.976. Now, one thing is that, so this one is called the coefficient the coefficient of determination, which is talking about variation. So that is simply the same as R squared. So R squared actually lies between zero and one. So we have zero and one with the zero and one being inclusive. So getting a value of 0 0.976, converting to percentage would be 97.6, we are just trying to say that ice cream sales, any variation, any change in ice cream sales would explain 97.6 variation in temperature. You can also take it from the other way around. Any change or variation in temperature would also explain 97.6% variation in ice cream sales. And that is what the R squared would do. Now, let us proceed. We have another data frame that we have, we've actually created. So we have the code, we have revise, we have exam, we have anxiety, and we have that of gender. Now, let us store these, this data frame into a data frame object known as exam. So I will just place my Keza anywhere on this line and simply run that. Now, when that happens, we can just take a look at this data frame. 
And then we have the code. The code will just simply would represent, um, for instance, the number of um, people that we are working with. So the sample size. So this one is not, not so much intuitive when it comes to um, um, making it part of data analysis or whatever. You can even ignore this code column, right? But the ones that we are much more interested in is revise, exam, and anxiety. We just want to look at the relationship between them. So like, for instance, you might want to look at the relationship between exams and anxiety and see whether um, what sort of relationship ex exists between them, all right? So what I really want to do right now is I can go ahead and check the correlation between, so I will go into the exam data frame followed by the dollar sign and then simply pick out exam variable from that data frame. And then I will go into the exam data frame again followed by the dollar sign and I will just simply look at that of anxiety. So I'm looking at the relationship between exam and that of anxiety. So by running that, we get a negative 0 0.6381825. That is to say that there is, first of all, the direction is that there is a negative relationship. Secondly, the strength is that there is about 63.8% negative relationship between exam and anxiety. Once it is a negative relationship, it's just trying to say that the more exams a person takes, then the less anxiety the person kinds of experiences, all right? Or the more anxiety the person experiences, the less exam the person is also likely to take. Hmm, that really um, may not be applicable in real life. However, this data is only hypothetical. So we we'll just stick to that, right? So at the end of the day, if we want to actually establish how much variation in each of these variables the other is actually explaining, then we'd have to go ahead and compute the R squared. So I'll just simply take the square of the correlation. So by running that, I get 0 0.407 and what have you. So this is to say that um, any variation in exam that a person takes, okay, that is going to explain about 41% variation in anxiety that a person also uh, faces whenever that person takes the exam. So this simply would mean the R squared. All right. Now, at the end of the day, we would want to establish whether the relationship between these two variables is significant or not, and also determine the confidence interval, the range of values for which this estimate of correlation would actually be between. So um, what we're going to do is to use the core.test. So let me bring it up here and just add a comment. So we test for significance, significance of correlation or relationship and confidence intervals, all right? So let me just simply make it and compute confidence intervals. So we use the core.test and all I have to do is to pass into it the two variables for which we are looking at the uh, tests of relationship. And so by running this line of code, let me clear the console first and let's run this line of code and pull this one up. And we get to realize that by default, R uses the person product moment correlation coefficient. And so first of all, this is the correlation value that we had in the beginning, right? Which is negative 0 0.638. Now we compute the confidence interval and that simply lies between negative 0 0.904 and that of negative 0 0.01. And so would this correlation coefficient lie between this range? If it lies within the range, then there is increasing a probability that our correlation is significant, right? Once it lies within the confidence interval. That is what confidence interval uh, actually says. But we are going to deduce much more information from especially the p-value. Now the p-value is 0 0.04708. Now this value is less than 0.05 significance level. Recall that. So this is less than 5% significance level and even less than 10% significance level. And so we have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that yes, the relationship between exams and anxiety is actually significant. All right. We could also have done the same thing for the temperature and that of the ice cream sales up there. So we could have said the core dot test x comma y and then simply run that 
and you notice that the p value is this value right which is 4.233 ye negative 0 06 this means it is 4.233 times 10 to the power negative 6 all right if you want to know the actual value then you would have to use a function that is known as format you use the format function i want to convert this scientific form to the non scientific form so this is how R would report some of these big values in scientific format, right? So what I'm going to do is to paste that value as the first argument into the format function and then specify an argument called scientific and then set this value to false. Now let me set it to true and then you will notice that it produces a character of the scientific form of the number, right? But then if I change the scientific from true to false, then we are now getting the whole set of values. So that is how, if you do not know what this scientific form would mean, just simply pass that into the format function and set the scientific argument to false, and you are going to get the entire values right there. So this means we have 0 0.0000000 whatever. So it's even zero uh, to the nearest whole number or to even four decimal places, it is zero. So once it is zero, the p value is less than. 1%. 1% means 0 0.01. So this p-value being less than 1% would imply that our null hypothesis that there is no relationship is rejected, and hence we draw the conclusion that there exists a significant relationship between temperature and ice cream sales. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so how did you calculate p-value? Which code did you use to calculate this p-value? Yeah, so the p-value is calculated um, automatically in R as long as you use this particular function, the core.test. You know, there are so many tests available. If you recall from our previous lecture, when we were looking at the assumptions underlying parametric statistics, we got to know that our data should be normally distributed, right? And so in order to test for whether our data is normal or not normal, we have to use the Shapiro.Welk test. So once you use that function and it will generate what we call a T statistic, a degrees of freedom, but the most important value that we are looking at is the P value. So once you have the P value, then you compare with the significance level. And the significance levels we explained earlier would be 1%, 5%, and then 10%. These are the common significance levels that we look at, okay? So if your value is less than any of these significance levels, then reject your null hypothesis. So this is where the p-value is coming from. So once you conduct any test in R from a given function, it will compute the p-value automatically without any troubles, right? However, in statistics, there is a formula for calculating p-values but we do not want to go through that trouble, right? So this is how the p-value is computed right now. It is done automatically. And so we just go ahead and use it to make our decision. Okay, thank you so much. You are very welcome. All right, so at this point, we'll just go back to the slides and later on, I'll make available uh, the, the, uh, the script. And so you would be able to replicate the same data frame that I've created uh -huh. right here. All right, can, so let's go back to the paste, slide. Uh, just, just one thing. Can you just paste that data frame in the chat so that if anybody wants to do it alongside, they can do it. Just paste that data frame only in the chat. All right, that is not a problem. Just a second. Now, we do have two types of correlation. The first one is bivariate correlation. This is where we are looking at the relationship between two variables, only two variables. So we call it bivariate correlation. Then we also have what we call partial correlation. This one looks at relationship between two variables, but we are controlling for the effect of one or more additional variables. So we, can, we will look at this one later on in the lesson. So these are the two types of correlation that we have. There are instances where you might have more than two variables that you want to look at their uh, relationship. The reason why we do not have a type of correlation called multivariate correlation is because it doesn't even exist in the, in, the, in the first place. 
but we do have what we call a correlation matrix. So if you want to look at the relationship that exists between um, a, a lot of variables, you know, the correlation matrix will just take each pair, okay, each combinations of two variables and just tell you what relationship exists between them. So that is why the two types of correlation we have would be bivariate correlation and that of partial correlation, not multivariate correlation. All right. So if you want to produce a correlation matrix, you still have to use the COR function. And only that this time around, you need to pass into its argument your data frame. Okay, your data frame containing all of those variables. All right. So um, we also have um, a heat map that will also visualize a correlation matrix. Let's go right into R and then look at how this can be done. So in R, we are still working with the exam data frame. Okay. And then by viewing the exam data frame, we do have revised exam anxiety and that of gender. Now, for now, I would want us to just ignore gender column and that of the code column, because the code column does not give an intuition. It's only giving us the counts of the sample size. So this is not any information that we would like to examine the relationship. So code is out. Now, gender two is categorical. We have not considered whether we can look at correlation between a, a numeric value and a categorical variable. So gender, let's drop it for now. Later on, we'll see whether it is possible for us to look at the correlation between categorical variables and numeric variables. So the three variables in the exam data frame that we are going to look at their relationship would be revise, exam, and anxiety, right? So these are the three variables. And so if we were looking at exam and anxiety, we just pass into the COR function just this way, like we've done before. But this time around, we know how to perform bivariate correlation. We only put in the two variables we want to look at their correlation. But now we have three variables that we want to look at their relationship. And so that yields what we call a correlation matrix. So, for more than two variables, we need a correlation matrix. And we still use the COR function. Now, before I pass into the COR function, the data frame, I would have to create data for only revised exam and anxiety or a data frame where the code and gender would not be available in there, right? So um, in order to do that, you know, when it comes to data management, data analysis, data manipulation, data visualization, there is one powerful package that we often use. That package is called the tidyverse. We've heard about that. Okay, I guess by now, a lot of you might have installed this package. So all we need to do is to load the package. If you have not installed the package, just go ahead and use install.packages and pass into its argument in double quotes, tidyverse. So you would install that. I have it installed, so let me comment it, all right? Now, let me run this line of code, which is simply the library of tidyverse. Let's load it. And it attaches eight packages in that collection including ggplot2, table, tidy r, and what have you. The one that we are looking at is dplyr, which is the grammar for data manipulation. So with a dplyr, there is a function called select. We can use that one to select the columns from a data frame that we want to work with. So what I'm going to do is I will use the data frame, which is called exam. Then I will use what we call a pipe operator, right? This one is also housed in the tidyverse, particularly the dplyr ply r package. So what this one is going to do is, okay, let's use the function or the verb select, all right? So when I do exam pipe select, what is happening is that we are chaining this function to this data frame. So r behind the scenes, would grab this data frame and simply drag it and drop it into the select function. So that is what happens uh, behind the scenes. So all we have to do is in the exam data frame, we need revise exam anxiety. And so I will just simply pass in here, revise 
exam, and then anxiety. These are the three variables that we need from the data frame. So if I run that line of code alone, this one, then we have a data frame containing these three variables, revised exam and anxiety. Now, once this is our data frame, you can go ahead and copy this, paste into the COR function. Or let's make it very simple. Let's throw this one into another object, okay? So let's call it exam sub. So a sub data frame, that is the idea. So exam sub containing the revised exam and anxiety, if I run that, then I can now pass that data frame, which is the exam sub. If I click on that, we have it open in the script window, revised exam anxiety. I will just go ahead and in the call function, I will put into it exam sub. Now let me clear the console first, highlight this line of code and run. And then we have a correlation matrix, a correlation matrix where the diagonal contain the value one. That is to say that each variable is perfectly correlated with each other, with, with itself. So revise and revise will have a correlation of one perfect because yes, they are the same values. Exam and exam will have a correlation of one. Anxiety and anxiety will also have a correlation of one. So the diagonal will not give us the information that we need but the cross correlations such as revise and that of exam now that relationship is 0 0.6281 all right so between revise and exam there is a correlation of 0 0.628 which is a strong positive relationship between the two variables now the same value here is the relationship between exam and revise so the same values up here would be the same value in uh, above and below the diagonal, all right? So those are the same values. So this one too would be the same value as this, and this one too would be the same value as that. So what this means is that between revise and exam, we have a strong positive relationship of 0.62 a correlation coefficient. Then there is also a negative relationship between revise and anxiety. So in that case, um, it is also a strong negative relationship because we have negative 0 0.8, which is approaching negative one. So we have a strong negative relationship between revision and anxiety. And then what else? We also have exam and then anxiety, which is also negative 0 0.638. That is also to say that we have a strong negative relationship between exam and that of anxiety. So this is what we refer to as the correlation matrix. Now, do you know what I want us to do? I would want to save this correlation matrix into an object called exam matrix. So I am saving the correlation matrix into an object called exam matrix and then we will want to produce so one of the best ways one of the best ways to visualize relationships is to plot a heat map now with a heat map there is one big package that can give us so much more information all right but let me start from the first package that was developed to create a heat map. Now that package we would use install.packages and then we would put in the GG core plot. And so once you have installed that, you go ahead and run the package. So here, GG core plot, that is to say the grammar of graphics correlation plot. So if you don't have it installed in your system, just go ahead and run this line of code and install it. When you finish, just simply use the library function and load it in memory. So I have it installed. So I'm going to comment the install.packages code. 
and then simply run the library of GG corporate. Now, once I have done that, I have shown you before that if you want to know the functions that are contained in the package, just type the name of the package. So GG corporate followed by double colon signs. And that would give you the, the functions in that package. And you can see there are only two functions in this package. So we have the core PMAT, and we also have the GG core plot function. So we are going to use the GG core plot function. All right. Now, in the GG core plot function, from the label on the right hand side, you can see we have the CORR. What is it? All right. We are here to find out. So now we know that there is a function called GG core plot. Why don't we place before it the question mark symbol and simply run that to seek help from R? on what this function is able to do for us. So the GG core plot is a graphical display of a correlation matrix using GG plot two. Now, this is the function. Now, these are the argument that can be passed into the function. So the first one is CORR. What does it mean? Let's go down there to the meaning behind the arguments. It says that is the correlation matrix to visualize. Oh. Have we had the correlation matrix? Yes, we have saved it into an object called exam matrix. So all we have to do now is inside the GG core plot, I'm just going to place into it the exam matrix and then run that. And when I run it, I do have a very nice heat map. Although falling short of some more um, information, we still have a heat map. Now it gives you a color scale from blue to red, where the blue, the deep blue, actually represents a perfect negative relationship of negative one. And then a perfect positive relationship of positive one would be the red color. Now you can see that the diagonal, all right, is red, all red. That means each variable is perfectly related with itself. And so revise against revise is this big red. This right is exam against exam. But then we are interested in the correlation of the off diagonals, all right? The off diagonals. So for instance, if, I look at, if we're looking at this particular box here, then we are looking at the relationship between anxiety and that of exam. And so a blue color, almost a deep blue color, this is light blue, we are into the negative correlation. So this one gives you an idea that between anxiety and exam, there is a negative relationship. Now, it is light blue and approaching a deep blue, so the relationship could be strong. Yet, how would we be convinced that this particular light blue color is not any color actually greater than this negative 0 0.5 or less than that negative 0 0.5, approaching negative one? Hence, we will need to put in the labels, right? If we have the correlation coefficients, uh, the numbers, um, plotted on each box to give us an idea of the relationship, that would be nice, right? So let us explore some more arguments in there. Now we have a method. Now the method is square circle. Hmm. So method is a character, of course, square in double quotes of character. But it says that the method is the visualization method of correlation matrix to be used. The allowed values are square, which is default. Okay, so that explains the reason why we have squares of the relationship. But then you can also make it a circle. Mm, can we experiment that to see? All right, let's go into the GG core plot function. Then after the correlation objects, I will just simply say method equals, then in double quotes, circle. Let's run that and see. Oh, so we have circles in here. All right, so how big the circle is will describe how strong the relationship is. All right, so this means that the diagonals are the biggest circles and they are red. So how big they are and the color too will tell you um, the strength of the relationship as well. Hmm. So it seems that between anxiety and that of revise, the relationship is very strong. A blue color means a negative relationship. So this shows that there is a strong negative relationship. 
but this one and this one, then this would be much stronger. So it means the relationship between anxiety and exam would be much stronger than the relationship between exam and that of anxiety. All right, that is just squares and then circles. So just the interchanging of objects. Okay, so I would say that maybe we really don't need the method. So you know what I want us to do? I will simply grab this and then paste it down here. And then I would pass the method argument and then change it to cycle right here. Now paste it again, where we go and do something more. So when I'm following the code, you run each one of them and then you would know what result you get. Now we do have a type argument, which is also a character. So test in double quotes. Full is the default one. If we make it lower or upper, what is going to happen? All right, so let's say we have a type argument equals lower. So it means that by default, it is full, right? And so the plot looks something like this when we are using the default method, which is the squares. But if we make it lower, type equals lower, oh, then it only displays the lower part of it so that we do have the relationship between exam and anxiety, revise and exam, and then revise and anxiety. So the diagonals are gone. All right. So if I should change this one to upper, then let's see what we get. Oh, there's the other way around, right? Okay. So what more? We have the GG theme. I guess we wouldn't really need a theme. We have the title. Okay, of course, we can specify the title, but not of much interest now. Show dot legend is logical. If it is true, the legend is displayed. Well, we need a legend. It is very, very helpful. So we have it on the right hand side, very helpful. So we don't want to turn it to false. The legend or title, yes, you can specify your own title. If you use the C-O-R-R, you can give it your own um, um, title name. But the most important thing, let me just jump through all the arguments. The most important thing that we need is the lab argument, which is false by default. What is a lab? It says that it is a logical value, so it can be true or false, but it is false by default. If you turn it to true, then it will add the correlation coefficient on the plot. Wonderful, that is what we want. So let me paste the same code right here. You can experiment with all these ones up there, but the most important thing is we're just going to say lab equals true. If I run that, oh, then it now superimposes the correlation coefficients on the squares, all right? So that would give you an idea of the strength of the relationship. So this is a strong negative relationship, a strong negative relationship as well, and the diagonals mean each variable is perfectly correlated with itself. All right, so this is how you produce a heat map. But let's look at this kind of result. It's wonderful, isn't it? But there is also another package. So let me just make it another powerful package. Oops. Another powerful package. And that package is known as the almighty GG stats plot. What would be the difference? First of all, we have to install it. So install the packages and then we pass into it the GG stats plot. And then after installing this package, you go ahead and load it in memory. As usual, I have it installed. And so I would just simply run library, gg stats plots. Now, if you are installing this package for the first time using this code, and you have not installed the gg core plot, there will be a dialog in the console asking you to install the gg core plot before the gg stat plot can be installed. The reason is that the gg stat plots, if you want to create the, the, uh, the heat map, then you would have to have the gg core plot, all right, behind the scenes doing that sort of thing. So the one that created the gg stat plot actually installed or used the function in the gg core plot in order to create um, whatever powerful visualization there is about heat map visualizing correlation matrix, right? So when you install and load it, 
Of course, maybe it will go through, but when you decide to use the function in the GD start plot to create this powerful heat map with much more information, then it will ask you to install the GG core plot. So there will be a dialogue here which says you have to install the GG core plot Y slash N, which means yes or no. So all you have to do is to type Y and press enter, and then it is installed. Or you can install this one separately like I've done here, and then go ahead and install the GG start plot, and you are good to go. So the functions, there are a lot of functions in this GG start plot, which, which would do so much more powerful visualizations, right? But the most important one we are looking at right now is to create a heat map. If you want to have an idea of the functions in this package, you just simply write the GG start plot followed by the two double colons. And then you would see that we have the GG bar starts, we have the GG between starts, we have the GG pi starts, and so many GGs, right? But the one we are looking for is, where are you? GG command, all right? So that is the function I need. So I've already loaded a package. I don't need the package before the function. So GG command, all right. As simple as it can be, why don't I pass into it the correlation matrix? Now you can pass into this GG core plot or the GG core mat, the correlation matrix, or the data frame containing the, the variables that you want to examine their relationships. But you need to make sure that it contains only those variables that you want to visualize their heat map. So you shouldn't have something like code and gender, which would, which would not be important in terms of examining their relationships. So all the time, if you are using the data frame, then you can use this exam sub, which contains the variables that I want to measure the relationships, so I'll just go here and in here, pass exam sub, or I am just good with the correlation matrix. So I just pass that in there. Now let's see there is no other argument just like this. I just run it and let's see what result we get. So in three, two, one, boom. Oh, something is wrong, right? It says error in names combinations. Hmm. So if we are getting an error, then what is really the problem? So the correlation matrix didn't work, right? Okay. Question mark, GG core math, run. And then R, you need to help us on how to actually work with this. This is a visualization of a correlation matrix. Now it says that the correlation matrix or a data frame containing results from pairwise correlation tests. Oh, but the exam matrix is a correlation matrix. Unless of course it is something else. If I want to know what, type of data structure that this correlation matrix is. Maybe I can just look at it. We use the class function, and then I pass into it the exam matrix and run it. It tells me that is a matrix array. So somehow it should have qualified to start in place here. However, the first argument is data. Data is simply our data frame, right? Let's go down there. So the data is a data frame from which variables specified are preferentially to be taken. So the meaningful part of this explanation is that it's a data frame, that's what we need. So all I need to do is to pass a data frame and not a correlation matrix. So like I said, you would have to create a data frame containing the variables you want to examine the relationship. And then I will simply change this one from exam matrix to exam sub, exactly this data frame. And once I do that, let's run the code to see what result we get again. It takes some time, a few seconds. And now we have our correlation heat map, matrix heat map, all right? So let me just maximize the zoom window and see what is really happening here. So actually, why don't we compare the visualization we had from the GG core plot and that of the GG core mat in the GG stats plus package. There is a difference, right? First of all, the coloring, right? The color scales are different. So we have something like moving from orange to green, whatever that color is, orange or uh, yellow or whatever it is. But then in the GG um, core plot, it is red to blue. You can change the coloring scales if you look at the um, arguments in, in, in the function, right? But then, there is one more important thing, right? We do see the correlation coefficient printed there, and it uses the upper type, right? 
So it doesn't use everything that we are seeing in the DG core plot where we have the diagonals having one, one, one and those meaningless values, right? But then this one, it takes away the diagonals. It only gives you the three variables that we are looking at their relationships and prints on top of the plot the correlation coefficients. There is something else. We see some of these correlations crossed out. Hmm, what does it mean? We'll come back to that. Now it gives you the sample size you are working with, which is just 10 sample size. Then it tells you the type of correlation you are working with, which is the person, right? And it gives you the scales from negative one to one. So green color means it is positive. So this one is a positive relationship and this one is a negative relationship and a negative relationship. And this one is much stronger because it is moving deeper into this color. Now the DG format, you know what it does? It also conducts a hypothesis test of whether the relationship between the variables is significant or not. That is what it does. So when you see the cross, it tells you that that cross has been labeled here as if it were X. The X here is simply saying the cross, all right? So when it has been crossed, it means that it is non-significant at 5%, at the p-value 5%. So this means the p-value is less than whatever it is. So it is non-significant. So this cross means the relationship between anxiety and that of exam is negative 0.64, which is a strong negative relationship. Yet this relationship is not significant. Now, this one too tells us there is, there is a, a strong positive relationship between exam and revision. Yet this relationship is still not significant. Now, this one says there is a strong negative relationship between anxiety and revision. And it is significant because it is not crossed out. Now, this one would be would make much more sense when, for instance, we get regression analysis and then we are looking at some problems that regression models encounter. One problem is called the problem of multicollinearity. So when we get there, a visualization of a heat map such as this one would be created for us to diagnose whether multicollinearity is a problem in the regression model. So that is later for regression analysis. We have a lot more to learn now. So this one just gives you the heat map, conducts hypothesis tests to see whether the relationship between the variables is significant or not, gives you much more information concerning the sample size you are using, and even the type of correlation coefficient that it is being computed. So once we have this, then of course, we've been able to achieve what our correlation matrix would do. Let's go back to the slides and proceed. So there are other correlation coefficients. So far, we have been using the person correlation coefficient. Now, there are two more. One of them is the Spearman's correlation coefficient. And then we have the Kendall tau correlation coefficient. So let's look at some of the functions that we've used so far. We have used the COR function, and we have used the COR.test to test for the significance of the relationship. The COR function can compute the Pearson correlation coefficient, the Spearman correlation coefficient, the Kendall correlation coefficient. And it can also compute the correlation matrix. So you see at the last part of the column, we have multiple correlations. But the only thing it doesn't give you would be p-values and confidence interval because the COR function does not perform test of hypothesis. Now the COR.test function can also compute the person correlation, the Spearman correlation coefficient, the Kendall Tau's, um, the Kendall's Tau correlation coefficient, and give you the p-values to determine significance and the confidence interval for which the estimate of correlation coefficient will lie between. The only thing the core.test function cannot do is to create a correlation matrix. All right. So that is the, the meaning behind that table right there. So person correlation coefficient, when do we use it? Now, we make assumptions on data. The first one is that the data should be interval. Interval in the sense that between two set of values, like one and two, there can be 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. So there's that interval. That is just to say it should be a continuous variable. So height, temperature, savings, all right? All those values are interval data. And so we can use the person correlation coefficient. That does not mean we cannot use the Spearman and that of the Kendall's tau correlation coefficient. 
but we'll come to that. But the most important assumption for which you need to use the person correlation coefficient is that the sampling distribution should be normal. Now, we have this intuition from the central limit theorem. That's why we have to go through all of that. The central limit theorem, if the sampling distribution is normal, then the assumption is that the population is also normal. Because more often than not, we are not going to have access to the population and work with it. So we only work with sample. So if we sample a lot of people in our studies and then we kind of test for normality and the sampling distribution is normal, nearly normally distributed, recall the central limit theorem, then it tells us that the population from which this data or this sample is coming from is also normal. So that is assumption. So if your data is assumed to be normally distributed and you want to look at relationships, then use person correlation coefficient. So the relationship that we examined between temperature and ice cream sales and exam anxiety and revision, we assume that the data is normal. Now, if the data are not interval, so maybe gender, yes, not interval, or they are not normal, then use other correlation coefficient. That's very simple. So when the data is not interval, and especially if it is not a normal data, then you should use the other correlation coefficient. And what are the other correlation coefficient? The Spearman's correlation coefficient and the Kendall's tau correlation coefficient. Now let's look at something. Uh, I have a question. So before right. doing a correlation and regression, we have to check first whether the data is uh, normally distributed or not. Absolutely. And then we will do these. Okay. Yeah. So we need to test that our data is normal. If it is, then yes, we are going to use person correlation coefficient to examine the relationship. If it is not- but Is there a way like without examining the data, is there any correlation coefficient which will tell, which will give accurate results in both in any kind of data? Like if you just want to see correlation and regression and you don't want to like follow the previous steps, like for normality, we have to draw a histogram and run different codes. Is there any way that we can use a single method which uh, which is uh, which gives accurate results with, with any kind of data? All right. Now the whole idea about <clears throat> this correlation analysis is such that when you have your data, let's say you have not really even tested for whether the data is normally distributed or not. Now, you can just go ahead and use the default function we've been using, the COR function, and examine the relationship. Now, whatever relationship that you get, okay, um, you, the most important deduction that you can make from it is the direction. So if you calculate the correlation coefficient and it is positive, then there is a positive relationship. If it's negative, there's a negative relationship. Now, if it is positive, it means that whether the data is normally distributed or not, there exists a positive relationship. The only problem that we will encounter is that you may overestimate the strength. All right, you may overestimate or underestimate the strength. That is the only problem you will get if the data, you have not tested the assumption of normality of data. Okay, so let's say you are working with um, a, a, an interval data, um, and then you visualize a histogram, it's probably rice cube. So the assumption is that maybe uh, it is non-parametric. Okay, so we are not making any specific assumption. It's not normal, so it's, 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 it's non-parametric. So at that point in time, then the choice of correlation coefficient to examine the relationship should be Spearman's correlation coefficient, or we can use the Kendall's tau correlation coefficient. But if you tend to use the person, now, because the data was not normal and the tests conducted also reviewed that it was not normal, the Spearman's correlation coefficient and the Kendall's tau and the person, if the relationship is positive, yes, you are going to get positive for all of these correlation coefficients. But if the Spearman's, which could understand the non-normality of data could give you a strength of say 60%, person would be giving you something like 80% or 90%. So you would see that the person correlation coefficient would overestimate the, the strength of the relationship. That is where the problem comes in when you're working with some of these uh, uh, data. So you need to test to see whether your data is normal or not normal, right? So the problem is not with the direction. If it is positive, it is positive across all correlation coefficient. However, the strength is either underestimated 
or overestimated. So if you don't want to overestimate your relationship, then you have to check for normality. And I believe that most often the data we work with is assumed to be normal. That is why we always stick to using the person. So unless people really want to go deep into the data to find out whether it is really normal or not, then they would kind of, the most popular of the correlation coefficient to use for non-normal data is Spearman's uh, correlation coefficient, all right? Okay, if that is okay, then we can proceed. <clears throat> So the Spearman correlation coefficient is a non-parametric statistic, um, which can be used when data have violated parametric assumptions, especially the non-normally distributed data. So the Spearman correlation coefficient is also known as the Spearman rule. Now the Kendall style correlation coefficient is also a non-parametric statistic and should be used, especially when your data is non-normal, but if you have a very small data set with a large number of type ranks. That is to say that if you have a lot of scores, it is going to take each scores and rank them, all right? So rank number one, rank number two, rank number three. And there would be some values that might have the same sort of ranks. So we have that large number of type ranks. Now, when that happens, then you have to use the Kendall's tau correlation coefficient. But one thing, one thing, one thing, the Spearman correlation coefficient for non-parametric statistic is popular more popular, but the Kendall statistic is a better estimate of correlation if we are dealing with non-parametric statistic, all right? So normally when the data is not normally distributed, a lot of researchers would be using the Spearman's correlation coefficient. That is, not, that is not to say it is bad. It is also good, but the Kendall style correlation coefficient we are saying is a better estimate of the correlation, all right? And there is a paper that actually explains um, the reason why Kendall style would be a much better estimate of correlation when the data um, um, has violated the parametric assumptions. And also, more accurate generalizations can be made from the Kendall statistic than the Spearman's. All right. So, um, at least now, between Spearman and Kendall style, when we are working with non parametric data, we know what correlation coefficient we should be using. If you use the Spearman, that is still not a problem, but we know which one is better. So let's go ahead and practice. Now, at the end of the day, we are not going to go into testing whether our data we are working with is normally distributed or not, okay? And I believe you can do that from our previous lectures where we look at the Shapiro work test that was looking at that normality instances. So all I want to implement right now is to see how we can actually implement the other correlation coefficients. So now um, let's deal with the Spearman. So the Spearman's row that's what we call it so it's just row or let's add the correlation coefficient just to retain its value okay so the spearman's row correlation coefficient and then when we finish we just go ahead and do the kendall's tau correlation coefficient all right so how do we do this now we need to use the cor let's use the Okay, fine. Let's use the, um, what do you call it? The exam and anxiety thing that we did earlier on right here. So the exam and that of the anxiety. So I'll simply copy that and paste it there. Let me copy the same thing and bring it below the Kendall style. Now, what I want to do is what sort of argument would I need to pass in there for R to know that I want to calculate the Spearman's correlation coefficient or the Kendall style. So what I want to do is I will say question mark and I will just write the name of the function call and seek help from R. So correlation, the core takes in X and Y. We've passed that as exam and anxiety. Use everything, okay, every data or whatever it is. An optional character string given a method for computing covariances, the presence of missing values. All right. Now, the most important argument is the method. So the method by default uses the person, which is default. So all you have to do now is specify either Kendall or the Spearman. So I would simply come here and then extend this one as method equals Spearman. And then here I would do it method equals Kendall. So let's run this line of code. When we finish, we are going to implement the same thing 
we are going to implement the same thing, but this time around, we are simply going to test the significance of the relationship, all right? So core.test. So we are assuming that our exam data and anxiety data are not normal. That is the assumption, but you must test it first to find out really, you visualize it and then you test it to affirm that it follows a non-parametric uh, distribution. All right, so now what you need to do is, I am simply going to run this line of code and that shows that we have a correlation coefficient of negative 0 0.59699. Let's run it up to two decimal places. So we have negative 0 0.59. 60. So that is a strong negative relationship of about 60%, right? Fine. Now let's test it to see whether, now compare this one, okay, to that of the person. So where is it? The correlation. Let's go up there a little bit here. So if I run that, you notice that the person gives you 0 0.638, right? So the values are entirely different. However, the direction they had it right. It is negative and negative. Just that one of them would overestimate the other. So you need to examine your data very well to know which sort of correlation coefficient to use uh, for the relationship so that you don't underestimate or overestimate the strength. So now I can go ahead and just simply test it. So let's test it and see whether the relationship is significant. Let's look at the p-value, 0.06. This is greater than 0.01 significance level, it is greater than 0 0.05, but it is less than 0 0.10, which is the 10% significance level. So you know something, if you conclude by saying that the p-value here is greater than 0 0.05 significance level, then you are not going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the relationship between exam and anxiety is not significant. But if you tend to say that this one is less than the 10%, then you will reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the relationship between exam and anxiety is significant. So it depends on which interpretation you want to do. So if you're working with 95% confidence interval uh, level, you know what to do. If you're working with 90% or 99%, you know what interpretation to give. And most often we use the 95%. So if I wish that the relationship, assuming I was using these two variables in regression model, and I still want them to be in there without having to exclude one of them or something like that, then maybe if this one happens to be um, two independent variables, then not being significant at 5% is the choice because when that happens, multicollinearity will not be a problem. But if there is a significant relationship and there are two independent variables in a regression model, then that is a problem. So... That is something that you need to look at. But if one of them is a dependent variable and the other is independent, then I really want to establish that that independent has an effect on the dependent, then I'll force to reject the null hypothesis at 10% level so that I will conclude that the relationship between exam, let's say if that is the dependent variable, anxiety, that is the independent variable, the relationship is significant. So these are some of the ways that we handle some of these things. We can also compute the Kandal's tau correlation coefficient. And if we do that, we get negative 0 0.39 as against the negative 0 0.59 that we had for the Spearman's uh, correlation. So in one way or the other, how it has been reported that Kandal's tau is a better um, 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 estimate of correlation coefficient for non-parametric um, data, you need to find out why. Otherwise, just know that we said it is a better estimate. All right. Now we can also test for the relationship. So call dot test with a candle in there, and we get 0 0.1212, which is greater than any of the conventional levels of significance. And so we do not reject the null hypothesis, and we conclude that the relationship between exam and anxiety, according to the candle style correlation coefficient, is not significant. It's not significant. And you'll notice that the correlation coefficient is printed also right there as negative 0 0.395, just like it is here, all right? Okay, so those are the two other types of correlation coefficients that we have. Now, let's go back to the slides and proceed from there. Now, there, is, there are these two correlations that we normally encounter too. 
you notice that all the variables that we've been working with are interval data. So it was easy for us to actually create correlation matrix, visualize a heat map, um, calculate the persons um, and the Spearman and the Kendall style correlation coefficients. But at a point in time, your data might be categorical. One of your variables in your data would be categorical. And that brings into the scene what we call by serial correlation and the point by serial correlation. Some of us may be hearing this for the first time, but it's very easy. So to use the by serial correlation, so we use the correlation um, representation of R, coefficient R, but a subscript of B. And the point by serial will be the same R, but a subscript of PB. So to use the by serial correlation or point by serial correlation, one of the variables, one of the two variables for which we're examining the relationship, one of them must be categorical, but with only two categories. So which means if your variable has more than two categories, then um, give a break before you try to run any sort of correlation, all right? Because, um, you know, we have been working in the university, so we've seen a number of students who are working, and they also have like it scale measurement and it has four or five categories and ordinal categories, ordered categories, and they want to examine correlation uh, coefficient, all right? So statistics, statistical assumptions must be key in everything. So once you have a categorical, in fact, when I studied the correlation analysis, I got to realize that there wasn't really any correlation coefficient that we can compute for variables with more than two categories, all right? I have not seen that. Maybe if I'm yet to come across that, I think we need to expand our research and and, and, and search into that. If there, it is possible for us to visualize or create a correlation uh, between variables that one of them has a category that more than two, we need to look at that. But right now, as far as we are concerned, there is this concept referred to as by serial correlation and point by serial. And it says that one of the two variables for which you are measuring the relationship must have two categories. And so we call it dichotomous categories. So dichotomous variables are one, either a person is pregnant or not pregnant. We don't have something that is called half pregnancy or almost pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. You are either dead or alive. We don't have half, half dead. If the person is um, motionless, all right, but still breathing, that person is still alive, not dead. So you can either be dead or alive, not half dead, not half alive. Now you can also be a male or female. Okay, you cannot be almost male, almost female. I know we are living in a world where now we kind of recognize um, some sexual minorities, okay? But when it comes to statistics, statistics is very firm. When we talk about sex or gender, it is male or female. Okay, so you're either a male or you're a female. And we also have an instance where you are passing or failing an exam. Now here, the passing or failing an exam if we set the pass mark to 50%, when you get a 50%, you've passed. But someone that gets 80% has passed very well. And the person that has 95% has excelled, right? If you have failed the exam, it means that the one who had 49% has failed because you didn't achieve the pass mark. But the one that had 1% has failed miserably. So you see that there is that kind of um, um, description that we give to the sort of failure or pass that you get. So the pass or fail an exam, there is an intermediary descriptions in there, all right? So at least one thing we need to know about this by serial point by serial correlation is that we must have two categories. Let's box on. Now, the difference between by serial and point by serial correlation is whether the dichotomous variable is discrete or continuous. Discrete dichotomous variable means you are using a point by serial correlation. And continuous dichotomous variable means you are using by serial correlation. So a typical example of discrete. Discrete means finite count, male or female, that is all. You are pregnant or you are not pregnant, that is all. You are dead or you are alive, that is all. So discrete. So pregnancy, gender, these are examples of uh, discrete dichotomous variables. And so when that happens, if you are computing correlation between that and another uh, variable, then you are looking at a point by serial correlation. But continuous dichotomous variable, you've passed or failed an exam, 
the one that had 50% has passed, 80% has passed, 90% has passed, 99% has passed. So even for the passing, we have levels, all right? Gender, male or female, do we have levels? Like I said, unless we are recognizing those minorities, but they are minorities nonetheless. So pass or fail, you can pass, you can pass very well, you can excel. So this one is called continuous dichotomous variable. And that means when you compute the correlation, you are looking at what we call by serial correlation. So say that I was interested in how much time people, and the people we are looking at gender, male and female, how much time people spend studying. In that case, the two variables of interest here would be time and gender. So gender, the time, actually would be a continuous variable. So the interval data, that time is satisfied. But we want to look at the relationship between how much time people gender, they spend, male and female, they spend. So the gender variable is discrete dichotomous variable, male or female. So we need to calculate which one? We need to calculate which one? The point by serial correlation. All right, so gender is discrete dichotomous variable. So we need to calculate the point by serial correlation. So let's go right into R and do that. Now, we shouldn't think that somehow, we shouldn't think that somehow the uh, point by serial and uh, whatever that might be is anything special. It's just the same COR function that we'll be using. All right, the same COR function that we've been using. But at the end of the day, all that we are just trying to achieve um, is that you are not going to say that you are looking at correlation because one of them is categorical with two categories and it's discrete. So we are just going to say, oh, the point by serial correlation between gender and time is like that. So the description of the correlation would give an idea about whether you were calculating for the normal correlation or a point by serial or by serial or the last one we're going to consider, which is the partial correlation. So as fast as we can, let's look at the correlation between time and that of gender. So I have saved it into an object called PBCORR. So I just try to say point by serial correlation, just to make it very simple for us to identify the data frame. So if I run that now, and then we go ahead and view the data, we have time and then we have gender. So all we have to do is, first of all, now this is how the data would look like, right? If I print it to the data frame, then this is how it looks like. Before we can use this gender, we'll have to code it. So we are going to assign the values of one and zero, okay, to the, um, the labels in the column. So maybe male equals zero, female equals one, or male equals one, female equals zero. So it depends. So you know what we will have to do? I would want us to create two columns where one contains a recode label where male is one, female is zero, and the other one is male is zero, female is one. After that, we will just build a certain intuition because I may make male equal to one, female equal to zero, but you also having the same data may make male equal to zero, female equal to one. So let's see what is gonna happen. So I am going to use the PB core data frame, and then I am going to mutate, right? If I want to create a new column or modify the existing columns, I use the mutate function. And in the mutate function, I am going to create another column, which is called recode one. Or let me just simply make it Gen one, all right, gender one. Let's make it like that. So that is going to be the column. And I'll create another column called gen two, so gender two. So for the gender one column, I am going to go ahead and grab the data frame, which is the uh, PB core. And then, okay, I think I would rather grab the gender, all right, the gender category. So we have gender here. So gender in the data frame here. So I grab the gender and I'm going to recode, recode where male is 
So male equals zero, and then female, female equals one. So look at how we use the function. So recode, so from the gender, recode male equals zero, female equals one. Or you can say recode and then place the gender variable first, comma, then male zero, female one. That also works, but we're using the chain um, operator, the pipe operator. Now I am going to copy the same thing and then paste it down here, but this time around change the male to one and the female to zero. Now we can run this to see what result we get before we save it into another data frame. So if I run that, it works, right? So we have gen one, gen two, where male is zero, female is one, and then where male is one, female is zero. So once this has worked, I'm going to go ahead and save it into the same data frame and run this. So when that happens, this is now our data frame. So time, gender, gen one, gen two. So if I want to look at the relationship between gender and that of time, then let's use the first one. So I'm just simply going to say the COR, and then I will grab the PB call data followed by the dollar sign time, and then the PB call data, the dollar sign, and then gen one. When I finish, I am going to grab the same thing and use the gen two, where we've just simply interchanged the recordings, all right? So now if I run the correlation, let's see what we're going to get. So if I run this one, now we get a 35.68%, right? So uh, 0.35, which suggests that there is a weak positive relationship. But let's run this the other way around, the recording. We get the same value, but negative. Oh, that is really serious. So when using the point by serial correlation or the by serial correlation, how you code your value labels would depend on what, on, the, on what direction your, your relationship is going to be, whether positive or negative. So if you record your male equals zero, female equals one, you are getting a positive relationship. If you record your male as one, female as zero, you are getting a negative relationship. Now at this point, statistics would not make any preferential treatment as to which one is better. Any one that you work with is okay. So if you made male equals zero, female equals one, and you get this one, I think the strength is the most important thing. So even if it's negative, it's weak. If it is positive, it is weak. That is what we just want to look at. So it doesn't matter how you label your value labels, all right? So point by serial correlation and by serial correlation makes no discrimination as to which particular um, direction that you get. The most important term is the strength that they need, not the direction. So this is how you compute the point by serial correlation. You can even go ahead and just test it out also. So all you have to do is to change the call function to call.test and this one to call.test and then just simply run that. And then you notice that the relationship is not significant and this one too, not significant as well. So you notice that they somehow produce the same result, right? A p-value of that and another p-value of the same thing. Okay, so the test of hypothesis would reveal that the relationship between gender and that of time is simply not significant. Now, the last two slides and we are done. So we also have what we call partial correlation. This is the relationship between two variables while we are controlling for the effect of one or more additional variables. So we are looking at the correlation between, for, for instance, exam and anxiety, but we feel that maybe uh, revision also has something to do with that, right? So that is the idea. So we are looking at the relationship between exam and anxiety, but we are controlling for revision, okay, doing exams or something. So we use the GGM package. And in that package, we have the P core function and the P core dot test to test for the significance. It is as simple as it can be. So the GGM package uses the P core and P core dot test. So the P core function, takes in two arguments, u and s, lowercase u, uppercase s.
And so when that really happens, the U is simply a vector of integers. Integers would be the positions of your, of your variables in the data frame. So if the variable you are using is the second column, then you can say two, all right? So it is a vector of integers. So if I'm using two variables from the data frame, and those two variables are found in the second and third columns of the data frame, then I'm going to create a vector of two comma three. All right. Or you can simply use the variable names. So you can say a vector of then uh, the variable names. So you use anxiety and you use exam. Then the second argument is a sample covariance matrix. So you know what you have to do? You grab your data frame. At this time around, you compute the covariance. And the covariance is simply means just take the data frame and pass it into the COV function. The COV function is used to create the covariance. And if there are more than two variables in the data frame, we have a covariance matrix. So for instance, you can simply go ahead and say the P core function, then a vector, a vector means a combination. So we put them into a C function. Then we can specify the variable name in double quotes. So variable one, variable two. And then we can now give the control afterwards. So if I'm controlling for this variable and more variables, I can do that in this same vector. Then my data frame, I'm just going to pass into the var function. Var is used to calculate the variance. Now, when you have more than two variables, the variance gives you a covariance, okay? A covariance matrix. Or you can simply change this var that you are seeing here to COV, the covariance is the same thing. So with partial correlation, when we say that you are running a first order partial correlation, it means that you are controlling for the effect of only one variable. So your formula is going to be something like, your code is going to be something like the P core, the vector of the two variables that you are running the partial correlation, and then you are controlling for only one variable in there. Then as usual, your variance of the data frame. If we are controlling for two variables, then we have a second order partial correlation. If you have three control variables, then you have a third order partial correlation. If you have four control variables, you have a fourth order partial correlation. So um, that is the, the description that we normally give it. So for exam anxiety and revision, I'm going to look at the correlation between exam and anxiety, and I'm controlling for revision. And for that matter, with one control variable, what sort of partial correlation are we conducting? A first order partial correlation. Then if, when you finish with that, you can go ahead and test for the significance. And the p core dot test function takes in three arguments, the r, q, and n. The r is the p core object, the one that you would have created in the previous slide, okay? So this code, after you have done that, save it into an object and then put that object in place of the r. So the r will be the p core object. Now the kill will be the number of control variables. So if you control for one variable, a first order partial correlation, then you will set the kill value to equal to one. If you control for two variables, that is a second order partial correlation, then you set the kill equals to two. That is what it means. Then the n is simply the sample size you're working with. So if your data, the entire sample size is 10, you just say n equals 10, and then you are good to go. So now we practice it, and then we are through. So with the partial correlation, I'm just simply going to use the exam anxiety sort of data that we're using, uh, which simply has to do with this exam sub. So these are the three variables. So where I'm going to look at the relation between exam and anxiety, and I'm going to control for revision. If we, have, if we had any other variable in there. So now that we know about the point by serial correlation, we can transform this gender variable into numbers. So male equals zero, female equals one. And we can also control for gender as well so that we have a second order partial correlation. However, you let's just stick to one control variable. So we are looking at the partial correlation between exam and anxiety, and then we are controlling for revision. So we are going to use the exam sub data frame. So when that happens, we would have to install the package. So we'd say install dot packages and put into double code the ggm package. And then when you finish, you go ahead and load it in memory.
So we just run this line of code. And now the DGM package has been loaded. Let me comment the install. So if you don't have it installed, you uncomment when you get a script and then run that line of code. There are a lot of functions in this GGM package. So if I write the GGM colon colon, then I do have all of these functions right in there. And they all have what they do. But we are interested in the P section. So let's go there. P, we are looking at P core and P core.test. Okay, so these are the two functions that we need. So I'm just simply going to say P core, right? And then the U and then X. But because these are the two arguments that can be passed in there, I can choose to ignore the U and that of the S if I want to. So I can say U equals and S equals. So I pass into it the vector. So I'll say a vector of what are the variable names in the exam sub? Exam, anxiety. So I'll just simply say exam, anxiety. I could have made it according to the data frame Exam and anxiety are the second and third columns. So here I could have made it one, and then this one as two, as simple as it can be, but that's okay. So, sorry, it's the second and third, right? So it's going to be two comma three, if I, were, if I were using integer of positions. And then the variable that I'm controlling for is revise. So that is also column one. So I could have made it one if I was using the integers, but because I'm using the names, let's be specific. So I'll say, Revise. Then my S is simply going to be the variance of the exam sub. So the variance of the data frame. So like I was saying, if I say the variance of exam sub, I get a covariance matrix. And if I should use the COV function and also run that on exam sub data, I still get the same covariance matrix. So here you could make it var then exam sub or the covariance of exam sub, whichever one, that's okay. So this is what we need. And so let me clear the console and run this line of code. So when we do that, huh, there is a negative relationship between exam and anxiety, controlling for revision, okay? Because revision might have something to do with um, anxiety and then exam pressure or whatever it is. So that negative relationship is, a weak negative relationship, all right? So once I have done that, I can just simply go ahead and save this into an object. So let me just simply call it OBJ, all right? I just don't want to coin any other foreign name. So I'll say OBJ, all right, object. And once I have done that, I can go ahead and use the pcore.test, which takes in R, Q, and N, where the R, would be the P core object, which I've saved as OBJ. The Q would be the number of control variables. And I've only used how many variables? One. So we are, we're dealing with a first order partial correlation. So here, I'm just going to set Q equals one. And then my N would be the sample size. So what would be the sample size? Let's go back there, 10 sample size. So N simply equals 10. When we do that and run it, then, we get our p-value, which is here, as 0 0.47. So what is this is called the t-statistic, and this is called the degrees of freedom. This is the p-value, the most important thing that we are going to interpret. So what it says is that the relationship that exists between exam and anxiety controlling for revision in exams, okay, is a weak negative relationship. And that relationship, 0 0.47 p-value, is greater than 5%, 10%, or 1%. And so we do not reject the hypoth hypothesis. And then um, we conclude that this relationship is not significant. And this is what we mean by partial correlation. So let me just put that as a topic right here, partial correlation. And that is how it's implemented. So at the end of the day, we bring our lesson to an end. And so thank you very much uh, for attending this lecture. If you have any questions, you bring it uh, in the discuss. Yeah.